I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the world. I do the world naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer sees a powerful amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of our social media community, brothers online. We're so glad to welcome all of you, brothers and sisters online to this service tonight. And it's going to be an exciting study and fellowship in the light of God's word. We want to also welcome the Akwai Bomb State community connected to the service right now by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Akwai Bomb, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. FM. Whichever platform you're connected to right now in Aquaibom, call a friend, a loved one, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community, let's get this word to the ends of the earth. Let's get people to be illuminated in the truth of Christ by sharing the videos and put them on all the relevant platforms around the world. I also want to welcome all our campuses around the world, brethren online, all our campuses everywhere. We rejoice to have all of you tonight. As we fellowship in the light of his word. Anybody excited about the opportunity we have to fellowship? Can we celebrate the word of God with a shout? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible with your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of his grace tonight. Uh, 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 what a blessing. Praise God. All right, Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 15. Second Peter chapter 3, verse number 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. The long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That is the reason why God is suffering long and bearing with all the things people are doing on earth, all the, you know, all the things, including those who claim to be atheists who say there's no God. The reason why God is suffering long and enduring all that man does is because God wants man to be saved. So the long suffering of our God is salvation. Next, put it up again. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the Sophia, the wisdom in that salvation given unto him hath written unto you. Brother Peter is giving credence to the Pauline theology. Next verse. He says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. <clears throat> so yesterday we established a number of things still part of the foundation laying and we're still laying that foundation even tonight. And we took time to establish conclusively yesterday that the Pauline letters, I call them the Alus Paracletos. Number two, I call the Pauline letters the spirit of truth. Number three, I call the Pauline letters the mind of Christ. Where brother Paul began to say, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him. But we have the mind, sumbabaizo in the Greek. We have the mind, the sumbabaizo of Christ. Or we have the reasoning of Christ. We have the explanation of Christ from the Old Testament. So let's look at the sermon on the mount when Jesus began to say, blessed, blessed, blessed. What did he mean? Let's make some comparison right now. Jesus uses the word blessed about 29 to 31 times. 29 to 31 times is the word makarios, makarios, M-A-K-A-R-I-O-S, makarios, blessed, blessed. He is saying it in an excited fashion in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed means well off or fortunate. Blessed, well off or fortunate. 
Then he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So what does he mean by that? Then he also said something like, blessed are they that mourn. Then he also said, blessed are the meek. Then he also said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that are persecuted. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and speak evil of you. What does he mean by all that? Well, all of that teaching will be understood clearly in the spirit of truth. Remember, when he, the spirit of truth, which means all of those statements will be understood in the spirit of truth. <clears throat> Stay with me. So that word blessed, only two times you will find the word holy, holy geo in the Greek, H-O-U-L-A-G-E-O, holo which means to command another in his writings. To command another in his writings. Sorry, to commend. To commend another in his writings. In Jesus' words, you will see it applied in Matthew 35, verse 24. Matthew 35, 24, in a parable where he says, you know, a parable of Jesus. You will also see it in Luke chapter 13, verse 35. Where he said, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now beside that, he also says, blessed are they who are persecuted. And you wonder, but no one is persecuted when he was speaking. You know, then he also said, blessed are they merciful. And you wonder, merciful where? He is talking about his kingdom. He is making reference to his territory. In his territory, we have the poor in spirit who are blessed. In his territory, we have those who hunger and thirst. Those are the people found in his kingdom. Merciful, peacemakers, those you know who are persecuted. And according to brother Paul... Because Jesus said those are of his kingdom. In brother Paul's writing, it will be those in Christ. So in Christ, we will have peacemakers. In Christ, we will have those who are persecuted. In Christ, we will have those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. In Christ, we will have those who mourn in Christ. So the Sermon on the Mount is not the greatest sermon of Jesus like some people claim. That will be contrary because he has already told you that the advanced explanation of his teachings will come after resurrection. So the Sermon on the Mount cannot be the greatest sermon of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon about you and I. Now look at the way brother Paul will put it in the Pauline spirit of truth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In heavenly places in Christ. That's the word hologio. And those two words are two synonymous words. Number one, it says you are fortunate, blessed, fortunate. The number two, he speaks, he speaks of that fortune. How are we blessed? Number one, he says you are blessed. The number two, he speaks of how are we blessed. He says we are chosen of God. Then he says we are forgiven. Then he says, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. All of those are expressions of this blessing. The next three chapters, he now tells you of the blessedness. He says, you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Then he also says, you walk in love. Then he also says, you fight. You fight. All right, all of those are exposed. They expose the walks of darkness. Then he also tells you, don't do evil for evil. Forgive as men hurt you. All that is in the Pauline theology. No anger. 
And all of those are the same on, on the mount. But we have the blessedness now. What Jesus was speaking to them on the mount that were in parable form were realities of his kingdom that will only come into effect after his resurrection. Now we are in Christ, we have all of those realities today. So I perceive that I must not see the audience of Jesus different from myself because he is talking about his kingdom and he is talking about the church. 29 times as he is talking, he wraps us by saying in Matthew chapter 7, He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, him will I liken unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Which is salvation. Salvation. You know, salvation is for refuge. It's a figure of speech. The Lord is my salvation and my rock. My salvation and my rock. My refuge. A figure of speech. So when the winds come and the floods come, my house is not shaking. I am safe in the rock. Then when it was done, they all say, this man teaches so well. He brings all those from the Old Testament and puts it to their face. He says, when you believe, like Jesus who put it in John 1, 12, as many as receive him, to them gave he the power. The word power is there is the word right. He gives them the right to become the sons of God. And that is in the incarnation. So he came from the Father to save. He now gave them the right. So when he's risen from the dead, they can now say, I am that man poor in spirit. I am that man that is now blessed because his sermons they believed and they become. If they believed what he taught, they now become what he taught. When he was teaching it, they will not become. They will only be given a promissory note when they believe. But upon his resurrection, they now become that which he taught. I don't know if I'm communicating. All right, now, please stay with me. So Jesus' teachings, they believe and he gave them rights and privileges. Because it was post-resurrection. He said many things that didn't happen while he was on earth. But will happen upon his resurrection. You know, um, except of course somebody is a fool, then he will not believe the prophets. You know, fools don't believe the prophets. So the Sermon on the Mount captures his kingdom. And that will take us to Matthew chapter 6. But we shall look at that a bit later. We are still in chapter 5. So he gives them the right. And we will see his apostles pick up those words. Macarius 2. An apostle of his will quote in Acts 20, 35. Acts chapter 20 verse number 35. He says, Acts 20, 35. I have showed you all things how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. This is Paul speaking. How that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs> well that is a quote we will never find anywhere. You won't find that quote anywhere. But Paul said those are the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It was Brother Paul's summary of all Jesus spoke about his kingdom in those words. Now Paul says, it doesn't make sense because fortune means I have. Fortune, fortunate, blessed. In the secular, it means I have. But Paul says, no, in the kingdom Blessing means I gave. Which means the kingdom of God is counterculture. In the secular, to be fortunate is to accumulate. In the kingdom, to be fortunate is to distribute, is to give. 
That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, you have two clothes. Your neighbor asks for one gift to him. You, your neighbor asks you to take him a mile, take him two miles. Why? Because giving is being blessed. Giving is being blessed. So that's why he says that Jesus thought and when he rose from the dead, he could use the word makarios and holy geos. For, he didn't use those words for anything material. Upon his resurrection, the blessing was not attributed to anything material. Anywhere you see the word blessed, after Jesus rose from the dead, it was not attributed to clothes, houses, money, and cars. The blessing was nothing material. Except you don't believe that Jesus is God. And you want to interpret the Old Testament differently. He changes the perception. What or who you call fortunate is not what he calls fortunate. So this introduces the epistles. And that's why there's no contradiction between the epistles and the gospels. It's just further explanation. In Matthew 5, he told them, you have heard, Moses has told you, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. And when he was saying that, they couldn't have done that because those guys could only be in the kingdom by faith. He has given them the right to believe those things will happen because those guys still hated, they still cursed, they were still attacking their enemies. But a right has been given to them that will come into effect post-resurrection. I don't know if I'm communicating. Please stay with me. Remember that this will be his soteria. He's a sotar. This will be his conquest. He's the conqueror. The sota. This will be his conquest. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that persecute you. And despitefully use you. That you may be the children of your father. Which is in heaven. They are not children by behavior. They are children by birth. So even though they were still operating that. When they believed what he said, he gave them a promissory note irrespective of their behavior. He didn't say as many as behave right. To them gave the power to become the sons of God. He said as many as believe. Are we teaching here? Now, so when they believed, they gave them promissory note. But upon his resurrection, they will enter into kingdom reality. And that is where all of these realities will take effect. And also remember, he was also bringing them to the realm where they will understand what he was talking about when they get born again. But remember, all that Jesus was saying, he was campaigning. He is bringing the realities of his kingdom, the realities of the church, the realities of his body to them in his campaign. And that is when the spirit of truth is given, then they will remember what he was teaching them in the four gospels. That was about us in the new creation. Blessed are this, blessed are that. He was campaigning about a reality that will take effect in his kingdom. If it's clear, can I have a good amen? Now, <clears throat> let us go further. Then he introduces them to something in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Put it up for me quickly. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next verse. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Next verse. Give us this day our daily bread. Next verse. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now hold on. Hold on. Already if you are theologically engaging as I'm teaching, you will already be asking some questions now. The question you will be asking is, go back, go back to verse, to verse the previous verse, verse 12. Forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors, is he learning from us or are we learning from him? So if we're learning from him, that verse has a syntax problem. Because he can't be forgiving us based on how we forgive. We should be forgiving based on how he forgives. So it's supposed to read, and you forgive us. You must add you. And you forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because we are learning forgiveness from you. Next verse. You lead us not into temptation, but you deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So don't fail to add the you because it is from him we are learning. He is not learning from us. Is it clear now? Now, daily bread. Give us this day. You give us this day our daily bread. The word daily bread there is the word a Episios. Episios is E P I O U S I O S. E P I O U S I O S. It means sufficient bread. Actually, it means bread for tomorrow or bread for the next day. Daily bread means bread for the next day. Now, it carries two things with it. Number one, what is sufficient for you and number two the day of the church the meaning of daily bread what is sufficient for you and number two the day of the church he is not talking about give you bread he's talking about something else what is that bread he's talking about look at proverbs chapter 30, 30 verse 8 proverbs chapter 30 verse number 8 Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. This is where Jesus quoted from. So which means daily bread there, daily bread there is not poverty and it's not riches. It is what is sufficient for you. Daily bread is not poverty. It's not riches. It is what is sufficient for you. Then in John chapter 6, Jesus now begins to put his words together. Talking about bread. Look at John 6, 32. John chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus now said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Now look at John 6, 27. So that you know that he's not talking about material stuff here. John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So when he's talking of bread, he's talking of something that is not material. It is something that is everlasting life. That's the bread he's talking about. Look at John chapter 6 verse 34. John chapter 6 verse 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Evermore. Then he says to them in verse 35. John 6 35. <clears throat> And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. I am, I don't have, I am the bread. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the bread of life. Then look at that John 6, 47. The discourse continues. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Next verse. I am that bread of life. Next verse. Your father did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Next verse. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven 
that a man may eat thereof and not die. He's not talking about material. Because there's no bread in the world that you eat and not die. So he has, he's using, look at this land. Lazarus, our friend, is sleeping. Let me go and wake him out of sleep. They say if he's sleeping, it's a good thing. He said the man is dead. Look at the way he took them away from, from, from dead to sleep. Look at the way he's taking them from bread to himself. Are you watching? The way Jesus talks is important. You must understand his use of language. He says, the bread is me. You eat me, you do not die. Then look at verse 52. The Jews now asked him in verse 52, they strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Because now they got the point. You understand? They got his message. <laughs> now, look at verse 53 and 54. You will love this. I love Jesus. 53, 54. Then Jesus said unto them, Very, very near unto you. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That life that they want to eat from bread and wine, they rebranded Holy Communion. Jesus is telling them, it is not in elements. It's me. I am the bread that gives life. Now put it up, put it up, put it up. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. When will I raise him up? For crying out loud, this is a figure of speech. It's not literal. Look at 55 and 56. Mm -mm. 55, 56. You will love this. John 6, 55, 56. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Next verse. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Is it getting clear? That means that bread is available in the new creation. So he's talking to them now as if it is happening, but it is post-resurrection. That's the way Jesus spoke. That means this will be available in redemption. Look at 57 and 58 of John chapter 6. Mm -mm. As the living father has sent me and I live by the father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Now, how do you receive everlasting life? That whosoever so believing is eating. When you believe the gospel, you just ate Jesus' blood. You just ate Jesus' flesh. And what is the resultant effect of that? Everlasting life. It's not some bread from a bakery and some ribena from one factory in Ogun State. That has manufactured an expiry date that they give you in small, small cups in church. And you, you, you know, even the thing that bothers me about that thing they call the Holy Communion is they said a sinner cannot eat it and a sinner cannot drink it. But who did Jesus die for? The people that ought to eat the communion, if the communion is really a serious matter, it should be unbelievers. And when they eat it, they should be born again. But because that's not what he was talking about, that is why when we now preach and they believe the preaching, they are born again because when we are preaching, we are feeding them the body and the blood. Am I teaching good? Stay with me. So this is the daily bread Jesus was talking about. That's why the next thing he now says 
in Matthew 6, 12, after saying, give us this day our daily bread, he now says, you forgive us our trespasses because the daily bread carries the forgiveness of sin. You forgive us our trespasses because this bread is our redemption from sin. And because now you forgive us our trespasses, then you lead us not into temptation. Rather, you deliver us by redemption from the evil one. Teaching good? So in Matthew chapter 6 verse 6, it's either a prayer for salvation for the unsaved or an affirmation of your rights in Christ. Your rights in Christ. So when it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, we will see that a bit later in this teaching. So Jesus taught like that, where he campaigns. This is what I am. This is who I am. A preaching is like a campaign. It's the Greek word keruso. A preaching. This is my kingdom. In my kingdom, the persecuted are blessed. In my kingdom, those who mourn are blessed. In my kingdom, peacemakers are blessed. In my kingdom, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake are blessed. This is my kingdom. Is totally different from Herod's kingdom. Is different from Caesar's kingdom. Is different from Pilate's kingdom. He comes again. He presents what you can call what is available in his kingdom. Then he says in John chapter 7, that great day of the feast when they are gathered. And in the Jewish culture, during that feast, the high priest ought to bring water. So now they are waiting on that great day of the feast in the temple. Now, Jesus uses the temple a lot to teach. Because, you know, the, the temple in the Old Testament was important because the temple is where God and man ought to meet. So, the temple was vital in the way Jesus explained it. Well, I have had some people, some school of thought say, well, when the Bible says, I will fill this house with glory, and the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, and, and that school of thought says that what it means is that all the temples that were built, there was none of them that God ever walked in physically until this last temple when Jesus entered. That Jesus entering this last temple physically was the glory of the latter that was greater than the former. That's a nice school of thought. That's something nice to think about. But it's not cool because Jesus said, destroy this temple. And after three days, I will raise it up. So he's talking about a temple that is not built in house. So when he says, I will fill this house with glory. This house. It is the house he built that he will fill with glory. And the glory of this latter house post-resurrection shall be greater than the temple of Solomon. So you are the house of his glory. Glory to God. And in his temple, where is the temple? Where is the temple? Every man speaks of his glory. So where is every man? Where is the temple? What does every man speak of? So what does every man carry as the temple of Christ? Glory. I will fill this house with glory. Now. Destroy this temple. So on that great day of the feast. They are waiting for the high priest to bring water. And a rabbi walks in there in John 7, 37. John 7, 37 to 39. Put it up. In that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Next verse. He that believeth on me as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Next verse. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This is what the spirit of truth brought to remembrance. Now, listen. 
when John said, this speak ye of the spirit, you know why John added this? John only could explain further like this because John wrote this after Jesus has risen from the dead. The book of John, that's why some people argue that it cannot be a synoptic because it contained revelation knowledge. But it is because John cheated the others. He cheated Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, and Matthew. Because the week John wrote first, second, and third John is the same week he wrote John, the Gospel of John. So that's why there are similarities between the Gospel of John, first, second, and third John epistles. That's why there is the language of the epistles in the book of John. That's why now John can say, but this spake he, which is an explanation of what Jesus was speaking in the synoptic which happened after resurrection. I don't know if I'm communicating. Okay. So that's why you find that clarity in that explanation. Now that's the same thing Matthew meant when Matthew will say something like Matthew 8, 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8 verse number 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirit with his words and healed all that were sick. Next verse. Matthew now explains that it might be fulfilled. This is Matthew explaining. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. What he was saying is that Jesus in healing was pointing to spiritual healing. That he healed the physical bodies that it may be fulfilled what Isaiah prophesied concerning Jesus taking on himself our sins. Alright? Now, which means therefore that he is referring not to the act but to the fact. He's referring not to the act but to the fact. He was saying the act refers to the fact. So they now had the spirit of truth. The resurrection now had awakened their minds to the reality of the things that Jesus was saying. Remember Jesus was campaigning. He was showing you what his kingdom was about. But as many as believe his campaign, he gave them the right to be sons of God. Then in John chapter 10, Jesus now says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I give unto you eternal life. You will never perish. They didn't have it then, but he spoke as if it was a present reality. So Jesus is campaigning. I am come that you may have life and be abundant. It wasn't available, but it was possible. Life wasn't available when you were saying it, but it was possible. So you need to understand Jesus is teaching ministry. The resurrection, therefore, will shed light on this in such a way you will see it. Not just in the possibility, but in the availability. He talks about the sheep. He talks about the hireling. He talks about life. Remember, the imagery Jesus uses, he uses death as pasture. He calls his death and resurrection eternal life. He wasn't talking of shoes and clothes. So to talk to an audience and say life, if you are talking to an audience and you say life, life, it means they are dead. That's why you are giving them hope in life. So when he says, I am come that you may have life. It means they, were, they didn't have life. It was a promise. It was a campaign of a future reality. They were spiritually dead. Then later in John 20, 10, 28, 29, he says, I give unto you eternal life. You will never perish. No one is able to pluck you out of my hand. My father that gave you to me is greater than all. And none can pluck you out of my father's hand. He was not referring to things. He was referring to the realities of his kingdom. 
Again, he becomes very applicable to us in his resurrection. So again, he was campaigning. He was announcing the realities of his kingdom. Then he says things like, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. It's still part of the campaign. Then he meets Nicodemus. Only you know Nicodemus comes to Jesus to celebrate miracles. But Jesus is not seeker sensitive. Just like many churches are seeker sensitive. You know, don't preach hard. Don't offend the congregation. Be nice. Pamper them. Entertain them. Give them comedy. Give them music. Let them relax. Preach 15 minutes. Seeker sensitive churches. It's a, it's a bunch of nonsense. And that is what is making Christianity lose the power that it's supposed to demonstrate. Because it's a gathering of sinners and making them comfortable in their state. Just gather them. Make them feel nice. Tell them God loves you the way you are. You don't have to change anything. Just relax. Nice. Seeker sensitive. You know, but you know, we're not a seeker sensitive church. We're a very radical Jesus church. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus. No man can do these things that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus said, hey, hey, wait. Except a man be born again. Jesus takes the discussion from miracles to the state of your spirit. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old like me, old man like me? You want me to go to my mother's womb and be born? He said, ah, Nick, 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 you are a ruler of the Jews at your age and in your status, an archbishop of Jewish people and you don't know born again? That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say, you must be born again. Nicodemus was listening. And Jesus said to him, this is the way to be born again. To be born again means to be born of water. Water is symbolic of the spirit. So Jesus wasn't sick and sensitive at all. Jesus cared so much about the state of their hearts. So Jesus takes their words, puts it on the Sermon on the Mount so everybody can see because he is campaigning. Then he now speaks to a fig tree in Mark chapter 11. The fig tree dries up, then he goes to the temple and drives out people from the temple. <laughs> Within the same chapter. He first speaks to the fig tree, then he goes, pursue people out of the temple. Then on his way back, Peter called him to remembrance and said, Master, the tree you caused. So watch this. It wasn't Jesus that caused the tree. It was Peter's description that introduced cause. Jesus spoke. Peter called it cause. But that was not a cause. That was an exercising of authority. That's why Jesus would say to them, you have faith in God. If you also shall say, he didn't say if you also shall cause. If you also shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast to the sea, exercising authority. Okay? Now, hold. Then Jesus said to them, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive, and you shall have. Again, Jesus is talking about a mountain figurative. Then look at the beauty of his explanation. He removes the fig tree from Peter's mind. He says, when you stand praying, forgive. He takes Peter's mind from the fig tree, from the mountain. When you stand praying, forgive. So Jesus identifies the mountain in humanity as selfishness and unforgiveness. That's the mountain. Unforgiveness and selfishness. Then he takes his mind away. He also does that. He will always point to something. Then he will take their mind away from that thing. And you know sometimes we are so fixated about moving mountains and speaking to trees. That we never walk and look at the end of that discourse. Because in that same breath Jesus now talks about authority. So somehow he adjusts the narrative in their mind. Forgiveness now becomes the issue of our pistis. Forgiveness. 
when you stand praying, forgive. It becomes the issue of our faith. In other words, the works of our faith will now be love. The works of our faith will now be love. That is, if you're really born of God, the resultant effect of being born of God will be a walk in love. The, the works of our faith will not be things. The works of our faith will be men. So he now says, look, I spoke to the tree, fine, but the works of our faith in God will be men. Then in Matthew 17, he now says to them, you speak to this mountain, it shall be done. So he calls faith the forgiveness of sins. He calls faith the forgiveness of sins. Please listen carefully. Jesus didn't do miracles to demonstrate power. Even though there was a demonstration of power, but the end point of miracles was to show character and to point us to greater realities that are found in God. Greater realities. In John chapter 4, he meets a woman at the well and he tells her to give him water and the woman is dribbling him around. And he says, if only you knew the gift of God and who is asking you to give me water, you will have given me your water and I will give you living water and you will never thirst. He has moved her attention from the well to eternal life. That's the way Jesus spoke all the time. Praise God. I say praise God. Then in John chapter 13, John chapter 13, he now begins to talk about feet washing. <laughs> the almighty feet washing. <laughs> now if you follow the trend of this course, feet washing will not be an issue anymore. If you have followed all of our journey in the gospels, feet washing wouldn't be an issue at all. Feet washing was a ceremony of the Jews. Jewish people understood why they were. Feet washing didn't start in John chapter 10. Feet washing started in the days of Abraham. Abraham is sitting down in front of his house. The sun is very hot. He sees three men coming. What does he do? He runs, takes a bucket, fetch water, and wash their legs. It's Jewish custom. It's like Igbo people will give you cola not. They will give you cola not. Eh? An alligator pepper. You understand? Or you visit somebody and they give you water. Or they give you garden egg and granite paste. Is that true? It's custom. Now you will not take that now and begin to say if you eat granite paste and, and, and yellow and uh, so do you see the foolishness in feet washing? Do you see the foolishness? <laughs> feet washing was a custom. Jewish people use it. So when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he was serving them. He was demonstrating how that in his resurrection, all of us, if we're going to be like him, we will have to serve one another. That's all. There's nothing other than that. I hear this January 1st in, in some church somewhere, they were even undressing them and bathing them in the church. They have graduated from feet washing to body washing. Very soon, they will not only wash their body, they will wash their house. Nonsense. We are teaching you revelation knowledge. You say it is hard. Religion will not only make you bath. You will start, you will go and, 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 and clean suck away pit. Because you have to clean it for your house to be clean. And they will give you the hose. You will use your mouth to pull all the feces. Religion, keep following Satan. We give you Christ. The simplicity of Christ. You say it hard. You go use mouth with, with hose. Suck out, suck away pill. If you don't do it, you are not clean. Satan is a wicked tax master. Jesus said, by washing of water by the word, you will carry bucket and put inside church. And you tell everybody to wash their legs. When there is the washing of water by the word. As I'm teaching now, the word is washing you. You are clean by the word. 
For the words I speak, they are what? Spirit and they are what? Life. That is more than enough. Hmm. Just they bring them. Peter said, don't wash me, bath me. <laughs> Jesus said to Peter, if I don't wash your leg, you have no part in me. See how Jesus changes the narrative. Now, washing feet is a culture. Then Jesus now say, let me wash you. Peter said, no, don't wash me. Then Jesus now introduces what he was trying to communicate. If I don't wash you, you have no part in me. So that means for you to have a part in me, you will have to be washed by my word. That means the way to be in Jesus is to receive his word, which is the washing agent that makes you a new man. He was using figurative communication to get the message across to his audience because of their state, which brother Paul will take now and bring it out in plainness of speech in the Pauline theology. Am I communicating at all? Please stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. <clears throat> so, in other words, he, beat, he bent down. God is showing you by example how he will wash us by serving us. It's not a miracle service. That is why John will say of his fullness have we all received. John didn't see that until after resurrection. If I wash thee not, you have no part in me. The washing of Jesus will be in his sacrifice for us. That is the spirit. That is the water. That is the allos paracletos. Paul uses the same term, washing. We will see that a bit later. Then in John 13, he says, You are all clean by the words I have spoken to you, except one. Except one. Who is that one? Because Judas didn't believe. He followed, but he was never saved. So there's nothing like Judas lost salvation. Jesus said, all of you are clean. Minus one. Meaning there's one among you that is not born again. Then in John 17, 3, he says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then he gets into the high priestly prayer. And then Jesus begins to talk about all of those realities. Then in John chapter 4, he begins to talk about true worship. The time cometh and now is when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why do you think Jesus told his mother, Mommy, my hour has not come. The hour he was talking about was not hour for miracles. Every hour was miracle hour for Jesus. So hour has not come is Jesus' unique way of, of talking. The hour to meet humanity's need. What you are saying is, mommy, wine is not their need. There is a need they have that is greater than wine. And my hour to meet that need has not come, which is death, burial, and resurrection. He is teaching the possibilities, not the availabilities. So right there, he talks about worship in spirit. And in truth. Worship where? In spirit and in truth. In Luke chapter 9 again, he's talking about his disciples. He paints three scenarios. Number one, one of them says, Master, I want to follow you. Then Jesus said, Foxes have no hole, birds have no nets, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, again, don't get lost in the narratives of Jesus. <laughs> Don't get lost. Because he had where he was sleeping. He didn't sleep on the road. So now when he's saying, foxes have holes, birds have nets, I have nowhere to sleep, he wasn't talking of literal. He's actually talking about the indwelling. That is the house I really want to live in. It's not yet available. It will be available upon my resurrection. I don't know if you are following now. Second one, he talks to another one. He says, the guy says, Jesus says to him, follow him. Follow me. 
The guy says, oh, thank you, Jesus, for the privilege you gave me to follow you. But my father is dead. He thought Jesus should say, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. <laughs> that is Jesus' style of talking. Let the dead. He is saying, I am sending you to people who need life. And you are talking about dead. What he's telling him is, don't concentrate on your father that is dead. I'm giving you a message that will give men eternal life. He changes the narrative. Third group. The guy says to Jesus, I will just go and tell my parents that I want to follow you. Then I will come. <laughs> Jesus says to him, no man puts his hand in the plow. <laughs> you know, how did Jesus sound, sounded like a harsh guy. You know, this one says to him, <laughs> He said, Jesus, I will follow you. He said, I don't have where to lay my head. <laughs> this was it. My father is dead. I want to go and bury him. Let the dead bury their dead. <laughs> this was says, Sir, you want me to follow you? Eh? Let me go and take permission from my parents and follow you. He said, no man putting his hand to the plow and looks back. He's worthy of me. He sounded like a harsh guy. But you see, he was communicating spiritual realities to men whose IQ was low. Are we teaching here? Then in Luke chapter 10, he now picks 70 people to go and preach. As a roundup, are you blessed tonight? 70 people to go and preach. Then, he now tells them the kingdom is here. He is not talking salvation, but service. And all these are not available, but they are possible. But these same guys, when it was now available, were willing to die for Jesus. Why? Because the Son of Man has where to lay his head now after the resurrection. All we saw Jesus doing the four Gospels now has extended to the book of Acts. He's alive. What he did for the Father in service, his disciples are now doing it for him in the book of Acts. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Are we teaching? Are we teaching? So, these are Jesus' campaign. This is my kingdom. This is what will be available. He uses the cross. Take up your cross and follow me. He had not died. And the people are wondering, cross for what? They have not seen anybody carrying cross. But when he hung on the cross and he died, everyone who believed in him, now takes up responsibility to serve. So the taking up of the cross is accepting responsibility to serve because of Jesus. People are willing to take up the cross. People are willing to give up themselves. You see Paul will say, Paul is servant of Jesus Christ. Our Lord also is a servant. So everybody in the kingdom is a servant. He's only mirroring what Jesus said. In John chapter 10, he said, He that does not forsake father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children. And most of the people he was talking to didn't even have a house. So he's speaking of the availability in the kingdom. Men and women who will take the cross of Christ and go anywhere with it. There's eternal life in that kingdom. And there is suffering in that kingdom. Because the kingdom came by suffering. So Jesus is campaigning. And that's what he's doing in the gospels. What Jesus was saying here is. You will serve the way I have served. But if you don't understand it. You will be using hundredfold for offering. Hundredfold is not offering. It's for missions. If you forsake your people. To go as a missionary to Ethiopia. There, you will get a hundredfold brothers and sisters. And if you, if you observe in the list of what you will get, he didn't include wife. But when he said forsake, wife was included. You forsake father, mother, brother, sisters, wife, children. You will gain brother, sisters, land, houses. A hundredfold. No wife and children. Because wherever you left them, they will come and join you. 
I love Jesus, man. That guy was smart. Teaching good, yeah? Wherever you left them, after you settle, they will come and join you. Is it not traveling? They will travel. <laughs> it's not eternal departure. <laughs> Go and check it. So he wasn't talking about hundredfold offering. Which preachers should say, if you sow, you'll get a hundredfold. Nothing like hundredfold return in giving. Hundredfold is for missionaries who left their village, left their homes to go and preach somewhere and serve. Then they were just like I left where I was in Zaria and I came to Aquaibon. I left my office, I left my home, I left my parents, I left everything and I came to Aquaibon. I wasn't married so I didn't leave my wife. But at least we were engaged. We were already talking about marriage. So I was here doing ministry and I was talking to her on phone. Talking to her on phone. After a while, I had brothers here. I had sisters here. After a while, I had fathers. I had mothers. After a while, I had land. Now I have house. And my family, my wife, my, my wife came. We married here and produced our children here. So thank God they don't even have to travel and come. They were manufactured here. Glory to God. Say, I will serve the kingdom because he lives in me. I didn't hear you, church. I will serve the kingdom because he lives in me. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a servant. Let that mind be in you. This is one year we're going to preach this gospel like never before. We're going to raise disciples in the most radical way disciples have ever been raised. We're going to go out like some people that have forgotten where they're operating from. We're going to take the world by storm. If you're part of the number, shout, I hear you. Yeah. We're preaching this gospel like never before. Manifesting the glory of God and demonstrating the kingdom. We preach, we raise disciples. Stand on your feet and say with me very loud, I will preach the gospel. I will raise disciples. Let me hear you say it again very loud. I will preach the gospel. I will raise disciples. Say with me, I am saved to serve the purpose of God, to serve the kingdom of God to my generation. Say with me, I am saved to serve the kingdom of God to my generation, to make available eternal life to the lost, to the dying. I receive the mandate and I respond to the call of God. Say it very loud. There's a call of God on my life. To preach this gospel. And to make Jesus know. I am fully committed. To the cause of Christ. With the whole of my life. I have a reason to live. And that reason. Is not natural. It's beyond nature. It is eternal. I preach the gospel. I raise disciples. I win the lost and I manifest the kingdom of God in my lifetime. Glory.